Thank you all for being here. We should, we should be down by the river, probably. Um, it, was, it was down by the river that I had my first experience at Vermont Law School and uh, first met uh, the then dean and president of the law school, Douglas Costell, the person for whom this lecture and for whom our uh, visiting scholar, distinguished visiting scholar, the Douglas Costell visiting scholar is named after. And, uh, and Doug promised me an exciting, amazing life as an environmental lawyer upon graduation. And he was, he was correct. I have had an amazing career and I've uh, always just, you know, in the way that your mind is open when you first come to law school, my mind was open and I still have this vivid sense of that experience with, with then Dean Costell. And for those of you who don't know uh, who Dean Costell is, and, and what his career was, was that he was, he has a long distinguished career. I'm going to pick out two highlights. One, he was the administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency under President Carter from 1977 to 81. And he did, and for those of you who know environmental law, know that that was an incredible time. That was in this ex time in which EPA was going through exponential change and growth and um, in implementing a broad array of all the new federal environmental laws, and Doug Costell was in the thick of all of that. And uh, I was, when I was an undergraduate, I took a course in environmental law, and, and I remember reading, there was lots of cases, you know, NRDC versus Costell, and, you know, different, uh, different people suing Costell. And so when I was applying to law schools, and it kind of came down for me between Lewis and Clark and Vermont Law School, and I saw that Douglas Costell was going to be the dean and president of Vermont Law School. It made the decision for me. I knew that he was somebody because his name was in the caption of so many lawsuits. <laughs> Uh, but I know, uh, and of course, the second highlight of his career was that he was, in fact, the dean and president of this law school and, and much loved and has uh, and had some very important contributions while he was here to the state of Vermont um, and nationally. He's, he was engaged in, in many ways in national environmental policy over his career. And I know that he would be particularly proud today to have his name associated with um, our speaker today. Um, Kathleen Falk is someone who has dedicated her career and life to public service, to social justice and environmental protection, and public health and a, a variety of other important causes. And uh, she, uh, I won't go through all of her career, but she had the stint that I'm most excited about describing is she had what I would call like a, a, a state attorney, attorney general's job, um, in which she was the public advocate for the citizens of Wisconsin, and had free reign to sue whoever she wanted, including the state of Wisconsin, to hold them accountable. So it was like a public interest lawyer with a badge. Um, and after that, she, uh, that, that position, sadly, you can't apply for that position. It has since been abolished by the troglodytes of, of in power <laughs> in Wisconsin. But um, after that, she left and became the county executive for Dane County, and I uh, think Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, kind of Wisconsin government, the county executive is a big deal in Wisconsin. A lot of authority, county government plays a major role in a whole set of, of public services in, in that state. And it's an elected position and uh, you serve what, 14 years? Uh, probably a record, um, it was a record. Uh, and, um, did an amazing number of important work in the area of social justice, uh, criminal justice, uh, infrastructure investment, environmental programs, uh, widely uh, regarded there. She also has in her, on her CV, um, the years that she spent working as an, a president, an appointee of President Obama um, for the Great Lakes region of the Department of Health and Human Services, in which she was responsible for, among other things, implementing the Affordable Care Act in that part of the world. Um, but one of, one of the things that she did, and part of the basis for the talk today, was that she served as the coordinator for DHHS and health services um, for the Obama administration in response to the Flint crisis. So I know that, that Douglas Costa would be so proud. I wish he could be here to listen to this presentation. I give you Kathleen Falk. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our new head of the Environmental Law Center here, thank you very much, and congratulations on your new appointment. Please join me in congratulating him. So my friends and colleagues here at the VLS Broad community, do you recognize uh, environmental injustice uh, when you see it? What's the fine line between unjust environmental consequences of actions and what could be called environmental racism? While many predict that these important questions will loom even larger in the future, what opportunities to achieve justice are there now and what challenges remain to eliminating environmental racism? I'm honored to serve as the visiting professor at the Vermont Law School this fall, sitting in the Doug Costell chair. I am teaching two courses, one of which is a seminar on the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Professor Melissa Scanlon invited me to speak today on the important topic of environmental justice, not only because of the significance of the problem globally, but the, also the important and ambitious mission of the Vermont Law School to educate lawyers for the world but also uh, because of my recent work on the ground in Flint for the Obama administration, connecting children and families with new health services during the Flint water crisis, which sadly continues today. I was honored to be the regional director uh, for the uh, US Department of Health and Human Services, serving President Obama and the secretaries of DHHS and the 52 million people in the Great Lakes states. My intention here is to briefly describe the history of the environmental justice movement, the moral imperative that drives it, and the opportunities this movement presents to both respect the rights of all humans and to solve compelling environmental problems such as climate change, for one. At the outset, let me note the obvious. I'm a white woman speaking about racism. I do know something, quite a lot, unfortunately, about what it's like to be discriminated as a woman or a first woman on many occasions in my life. But let me humbly acknowledge and that while I know and love many of my friends who are people of color and I've seen hurt by racism, I don't know what it's like to experience being the victim of racism. I'm counting on the students in my class. I'm counting on you all here to keep and set me straight and I'm looking forward to the conversation that continues after my brief remarks. Because if white people don't step up and talk about it, then a one-sided conversation isn't gonna get us very far. And it certainly isn't gonna move us forward on the arc of the moral universe that President Obama oft refers to. So first, what is environmental justice? In a book entitled Environmental Communication in the Public Sphere, Robert Cox and Phaedra Pizzula pose this definition. It's recognizing and halting the disproportionate burdens imposed on the working class and people of color by environmentally harmful conditions. Or the more inclusive, it's a positive, more inclusive opportunities for those who are most affected so they can be heard in decisions affecting their communities. Or even more positively, a vision of environmentally healthy economically sustainable and cultural thriving communities. You will notice that this definition does not use the words environmental racism, which others define to be this, racial discrimination and environmental policy making and enforcement, deliberate targeting of people of color communities for toxic waste facilities or for the official sanctioning of pollutants in communities, or the history of excluding people of color from leadership in the environmental movement. Now the word deliberate suggests purposeful intent to discriminate, and others argue that environmental racism includes disparate impact, analogous to use of that term in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which includes disparate impact as evidence of racial discrimination, regardless of intention. Others define environmental racism even more broadly, to capture those situations where the discrimination isn't the result of an action, but instead a failure to act, or as a result of systemic or structural policies in a community, such as the widespread restrictive housing covenants of the 1950s, or home mortgage policies that redline neighborhoods, or how school district boundaries were created 
and funded. You know that long list and more on this in a moment. The Cox and Pazula book traces the history of environmental injustice, noting the history of Native American genocide and colonization linked with land removal, resource exploitation, and toxic chemical exposure. Then later in the 20th century, the struggles of immigrant and migrant farm workers exposed to pesticides. In the 1960s and 70s, it was African American civil rights groups, churches, and environmental leaders who linked civil rights to environmental problems facing urban minorities. Although Cox and Pizzula note that the national environmental groups at that time, quote, largely failed to support communities of color and working class communities, end quote. This failure provoked both public criticism and the call for an emergency summit, which was held in 1991 and is often called a watershed in the environmental movement. So change began. The National Environmental Groups listened and have been working hard to incorporate environmental justice into their missions. In 1993, the Environmental Protection Agency created a National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee to gather input from environmental justice organizations. In 1994, President Clinton issued an executive order on environmental justice, directing every federal agency to make environmental justice a part of its mission. And while this lapsed during the administration of President George W. Bush, President Obama's EPA administrator committed to a set of strategies called the Environmental Justice Plan 2014 and to incorporate environmental justice through the work of that department. In fact, the EPA administrator chairs a 17 federal agency, interagency working group on environmental justice. One of our very own Vermont law students here, Sherry White, came here to this school from EPA, where she was a leader in the EPA's environmental justice program, reaching out to communities across the country. All of this change in the right direction, and yet, here we are in 2017, and many people in the community of Flint, Michigan, and in many other communities, still don't trust or want to drink the water out of their own water filter kitchen faucet. Now you may notice on the screen there, uh, thanks to Jam and Tom and Jen, students in my class who 20 minutes ago were sent uh, that, uh, that picture on their phone by one of our fellow VLS students who in her apartment, that's the water coming out of her faucet. You all know that today, South Royalton issued a water alert, saying people don't drink the water. We all got the emails thanks to the VLS staff here being so on top of things, with a boil advisory. Flint is not alone. And that's why changing 160 people here every year you're gonna be out there working on South Royalton and Flint and communities all across the country. Well, as I mentioned, and as, as David introduced me, I had the privilege of working for Flint residents. Responding to this crisis was a priority for President Obama. I was on the ground there for many months, living out of a hotel, not forgetting at any moment that I was able to drink the water in the hotel at the end of a workday while the residents of Flint could not enjoy that same simple and important drink of water in their homes. Flint is a warm and welcoming community. It's in the heart of Michigan. They are close-knit for good reasons. It's been through the best of times and it's been through the worst of times. A half a century ago, it was a key part of the auto industry with good paying jobs and a growing population. As the auto industry changed dramatically, so did Flint. Some of you have, made, have seen the movie Roger and Me by Michael Moore who grew up in Flint. For those of you who have not, a few salient facts tell the story well. In 1960, Flint was the 62nd largest city in the entire country. Today, the population of Flint is half of what it was then. It's now about 100,000, before it was about 200,000 and about 5,000 fewer than just a few years ago. Today, most of the good paying jobs are gone and the median household income is half that of the rest of the state of Michigan, about 25,000 a year as opposed to 50,000 a year. 
About 55% of the community is African American, 37% is white, and about 4% is Hispanic, a small but growing population. Sadly, about four out of 10 residents live below the federal poverty level, which to remind you as an example, if you're a family of four, that's an income of less than $30,000 a year. And while the median housing value in the state of Michigan is about $122,000, in Flint, it is not surprising to know that it is one fourth that value at about $32,000. Their hero, pediatrician, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, who connected so many of the dots to expose the lead crisis, sadly noted, life expectancy in Flint is 15 years less than in a neighboring zip code. In 2011, the state of Michigan took the unusual step to intervene in the city of Flint because of the city's fiscal challenges. The governor appointed a series of emergency managers and out of that process in 2014, a decision was made to discontinue buying the community's water from the city of Detroit out of Lake Huron, but instead for Flint residents to get their water from the Flint River, which runs through the city, much like the White River flows through South Royalton and our campus here. They did this to save money. It wasn't long until moms and dads began to notice the foul smell and the dirty color of the water coming out of their faucets, their children's rashes and stomach aches, they suffered hair loss, and they themselves too were ill. And as they began to worry, they started asking questions, only to be told by officials that the water was safe. It wasn't until medical and water scientists began to look at the data and do independent research that a new diagnosis emerged. The people of Flint were drinking lead-contaminated water. When the city switched sources to the Flint River, it neglected to add a chemical that helps prevent lead from leaching out of old water pipes, an inexpensive practice that many communities around the country routinely do, given the aging infrastructure nationwide. With no level of lead considered safe in drinking water, especially for children, the alarm was immediate. Even larger and more immediate was the complete breakdown of trust between residents and government at virtually every level. Flint made the national headlines and we all saw truckloads of water bottles pour into Flint. Michael Moore didn't hold back when he said, quote, the people of my hometown Flint, Michigan are being poisoned. Let me not mince words, he said. This is a racial crime. If it were happening in any other country, we'd call it an ethnic cleansing. Government declared an emergency and began to respond. President Obama made this a top priority for federal agencies and he personally came to Flint to talk with residents. Governor Schneider created a special task force to review all that had happened and it succinctly concluded, quote, the Flint water crisis is a clear case of environmental injustice, end quote. It went on to say, environmental justice is not just about intent, but it's about process and results fair treatment, equal protection, and meaningful participation in, in neutral forums that honor human dignity. Environmental injustice often occurs when parties charged with the responsibility to protect public health fail to do so. Flint residents, who are a majority black or African American and among the most impoverished of any metropolitan area in the United States, did not enjoy the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards as that's provided to other communities. That was the governor's task force, and it went on yet to say further. Moreover, by virtue of them being subject to the emergency manager law, Flint residents were not provided equal access to and meaningful involvement in the government decision-making process. Now, Michigan is very unusual in that it had also had taken several other steps that most states have not done in order to try to prevent discrimination. A draft environmental justice plan had been developed under the direction of former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm in 2009, and yet this did not prevent the Flint water crisis. One of the many recommendations of the 2016 task force report to Governor Snyder was to reinvigorate that earlier plan. 
Also very unusual is that Michigan had years earlier created in its own state constitution a civil rights commission to investigate discrimination based on religion, race, color, national origin, sex, age, marital status, height, weight, arrest record, and physical and mental disabilities. This commission immediately launched an investigation into the water crisis. And after a year of hearings, visiting neighborhoods, and soliciting expert views, it first acknowledged that it too should have been more proactive in responding to the crisis, and it pledged to do better in the future. Its final report just issued uh, early this year, it says, quote, the commission believes that we have answered our initial question. Was race a factor in the Flint water crisis? Our answer is an unreserved and undeniable yes. We do not base our findings on any one particular event. It's based on a plethora of events and policies that so racialize the structure of public policy that it systematically produced racially disparate outcomes adversely affecting a community primarily made up of people of color. So where are we now in Flint? Much has been done to try to ameliorate the harm from the lead, especially to children. Government at every level, foundations, and many organizations stepped up with enormous generosity. Let me give you a few examples of what the United States Department of Health and Human Services has done uniquely here for Flint residents. Medicaid eligibility was broadened so substantially that it covers almost all pregnant women and young people under the age of 21. And these important physical and mental health services follow the person even if they move from Flint. Physical and mental health coverage was expanded for all um, people in Flint, no matter their age or their income. And physical and mental health coverage was also expanded for children to include all those additional wraparound services that any one particular child might need, whether it was extra school tutoring because they were falling back in classes or uh, something as simple as more nutritious food in their homes. In addition, the federal government worked with the state government and state funds and has created a program now that will remediate all the lead hazards in those homes where there has been a high level of blood, a level of lead tested in the blood, including removing the lead paint from the walls and soil remediation in the yards outside of these homes. Uh, there is no place else that that, that is being done um, in these Medicaid programs. Just recently, after much work by the federal, state, and local health leaders, a federal, the federal government launched a new and unprecedented lead exposure registry which will track and support victims of the water crisis for years. In addition, a number of officials have been criminally charged or indicted for their roles in this tragedy. Federal judges have ruled on behalf of lawsuits brought by citizens that set some remedies and deadlines. Data shows that lead levels continue to decrease and the water quality continues to improve. Although EPA still advises residents to continue to use water filters, today in South Royalton, don't drink your water without boiling it. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been allocated at a federal and state level to replace the water pipes over the next few years. But Flint is not alone. We know that. We've seen that today in South Royalton. But in Flint, you know, and in other communities, the level of lead is so high um, across the country. In an article to the American Bar Association this spring, our own Environmental Law Center Director, David Mears, calls to attention the, quote, poor state of our nation's drinking water infrastructure. And he said, of special note, research has demonstrated that Flint is not an anomaly. Economically disadvantaged communities and communities of color across the country disproportionately receive contaminated drinking water. Recall that Civil Rights uh, Commission that I mentioned briefly before from Michigan? Well, it didn't just stop where I stopped that quote when it called the situation in Flint a matter of environmental racism. It said, having, quote, having answered our initial question, we now ask but leave unanswered another. If, without racist intent, a systematic problem repeatedly produces different results based on people's skin color, 
How long does it take before leaving the system in place is itself racism? This is the moral imperative to us now. How will you, how will we respond? As scholars of the law here, do we have an extra duty? In her new book called Law and Policy for a New Economy, Vermont Law School professor Melissa Scanlon hits that squarely. And she says, in the main, environmental law is oblivious to racial, social, and wealth inequalities. While the environmental justice movement has sprouted alongside to correct this course, this is often too little too late. She challenges us to, quote, rethink what we consider environmental law. We need laws that facilitate a new ecologically sustainable system, end quote, she writes. Not just how many parts per billion of a pollutant are allowed in our water. Indeed, this is a heavy lift she calls us to. Are you up for it? Generations of oppression is understandably why people may feel powerless to take on this challenge. I know from my lifelong work to change big and powerful institutions that if people feel hopeless, then they cannot get up and do what needs to be done to solve the problem. But there are signs of hope. For Flint, as bad as the crisis has been, the pride and spirit of Flint remains strong. You see these signs behind you. This is from Flint. This isn't an EPA or a HHS or a federal government doc posters. See that beautiful chandelier right there? That's made out of uh, recycled water bottles by the children of Flint that Dr. Mona sent me. It hangs in my home. In her words, Dr. Mona, despite this tragedy, I want to remind you that our Flint kids are more than resilient. They are exemplary and they are leading the way forward. If she can be hopeful for Flint, so can we. Can we be hopeful for our country? Police shootings, hate crimes, pipelines across sacred Native American land, and the 2016 elections have galvanized people into standing up and taking action. Great new young leaders are rising up to lead. I recently met Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr. He's the president of the Hip Hop Caucus and he's a national climate change leader. Rolling Stone named him one of the country's new green heroes, and the Huffington Post ranked him as one of the top 10 change makers in the green movement. I met him when he came to Wisconsin to educate us there. When I asked him what called him to the climate change mission, he told me he had grew up in New Orleans, and Katrina was that aha moment for him, with all the suffering inflicted upon people of color by the flooding, and the obvious need for change in environmental policy. So he travels the country, empowering people, inspiring hope. How about for our world? Many international organizations are organizing those most oppressed to work together in common purpose, bringing understanding and new listening tools to help people heal from oppression and to build alliances to work together. As one group put it, Quote, the environmental crisis cannot be resolved without ending racism or genocide towards indigenous peoples or classism or sexism. The impact of environmental destruction and climate change falls most heavily on people targeted by these particular oppressions. Oppression also divides people from others who have the same interest and sets everyone against one another. It interferes with the united response to the environmental crisis. Perhaps our common purpose in working on compelling issues like climate change will help break down those systemic and structural origins of racism. And right here at VLS, there is hope in action. The incredible diversity and talent that I see every day in the VLS student body means there are hundreds of leaders graduating every year with the skills to call out environmental justice and racism and to hold us all accountable and to mobilize us to do something about it. But some of them don't wait to leave and to do this. Just last spring, right here, VLS students organized an environmental justice conference on campus, and it drew, they drew here to speak those very same pioneers I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, who led that summit in 1991 and the outcry that followed and created change. 
That conference this past spring sparked interest in continuing that work here. Maybe another conference in the future. And thanks to the leadership of our new dean, Tom McHenry, and the environmental law sector of director, David Mears, and Professor Scanlon, and the other great leaders here at the Vermont Law School, this school is now hiring a clinical professor to expand the Vermont Law School environmental justice capacity through the creation of a new environmental justice initiative. The school's environmental and natural resources law clinic is partnering with Earth Justice, and they will uh, do cases and projects throughout New England and the rest of the country. So let me close by invoking the person who probably had the right to be most hopeless, and yet chose not to be, day after day, year after year. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. preached, we must accept finite disappointment, but never give up infinite hope. We won't. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, we are, we're live streaming right now, and law students from across the country are observing this. And in order to, to help them uh, kind of observe and participate in this conversation, which we now have time to engage with, I'd ask that anyone who wants to speak or has a comment, I know it's a little bit clumsy, but if you'd be willing to come up to this microphone to ask your question or share your comment, um, I know that Professor Falk is, is interested in engaging in a, in a much deeper conversation to hear some of your thoughts and ideas. So please, please come forward and, and ask a question. Who will be the first brave soul? After I said that you're being streamed live, you know, <laughs> worldwide. Yes, please, Nisha. And if anyone else would like to, please just you come around and, and line up um, behind Nisha. So thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, very inspiring comments. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion about the role of the media in this systemic environmental racism, um, because the media tends to determine our national priorities and how fast certain problems get done. Um, what have you seen through Flint, and what have you seen through the lack of media coverage and other issues? Uh, your question is, is such a good one, and you, you made the point well by how you framed your question, that you know we need the media to generate attention so that big problems get solved, and we saw the response in Flint uh, that did just that. What we can't rely on is the media to do the rest of the work. They can kick us off, thank goodness, but they can't win the war. That's us. And I know that we have faculty here and students who are putting on a media uh, and society conference. I believe it's next Friday. Go to that because you all, as the change agents you are, need to learn how to use that and, more importantly then, how to make sure you don't stop once the media go away. And that's why, you know, the the again, the, the more of, of a moral justice bends slowly, but we have to be the ones that carry that weight by the skills you'll learn here to stick with it and, and move the policymakers in all the arenas that we have, you know, from the legislature to the, to the courts and organizing people, and that we can do. We need the media to help us get that out, but then the job is ours. Any, any other thoughts on that that anybody else wanted to share? Josh. Thank you, Professor Falk. Um, I, I take your call to action very seriously, and I think you have plenty of people here in the crowd who likewise want to go into these places and make a difference. Um, my question is, is, as someone who worked in the federal government and went into Flint, um, I am not someone who is from Flint, Michigan, or the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, some places where these atrocities happen. How would I enter a community and show them that I am there to help and not just another hurdle, another talking head, someone who has ignored their issues for so long. How do I ingratiate myself as someone who's trying to solve the problem rather than just another hurdle? 
Well, I, I don't think Josh will mind because he identified himself in other situations as also being a, a reverend. And, and so he, he, ha, he is a, a person with many skills um, in this mission. Um, but here's what I would answer to that. You're all busy people. You all have lives to lead in addition to the good work you want to do. So start by being really practical to yourself. If I've got one hour a week, I'm going to devote to the South Royalton or to Detroit or to San Diego, California or wherever it is you're going to land, then do that one hour. It doesn't have to be your whole life because by doing that one hour week after week after week, that's how you earn people's trust. It doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to be the one to ride in on a white stallion None of us have that. You all have those skills and you are all those leaders. You wouldn't be at this school to be able to make a difference wherever you go back to. Pick what you are good at and what you have a passion for and commit that one hour a week. If you can do more, great. But doing one hour a week, week after week, for the rest of your life, Martin Luther King would be proud of you. But, but let me invoke another. Because if you're thinking that there is just this one smart thing if I figured it out to do, if you wait to get to that point, you will be paralyzed and not do anything. And Mahatma Gandhi said, it isn't important what you do, it's important you do something. And it was his Zen way of saying, don't think you gotta figure the whole thing out. Because none of us do. You just get up and figure out if I do this one hour, the world will be better. And then if I do it again, it will be better. And that's how you get to people trusting you. And over time, you've made a difference. Hi, thank you very much for coming today. Um, I have a question about the mechanics of actually getting something done. So as someone who's been in the federal government for years, um, when you walk into a room and you're trying to get someone on your side, and they clearly are not interested because that would mean that they would be held accountable for their past actions. How do you break through and get them to understand that this is a matter of life or death for people? It's, it's not about blaming, it's about fixing. How do you talk to them like that? Who's the audience that you're referring to? Old white legislators. <laughs> <laughs> that narrows it, thank you. Um, in my course, as my students here know, I spend most of the time saying the way you're going to accomplish change is by putting yourself in the position of that person who you're trying to change. What, what are they thinking? Who do they react to? What pushes their buttons? What holds them accountable? And then you get the answer. So it could be the old white congressional delegation, as she put it. They were, they're going to have a spectrum within it. So who is that one person you've got to reach at that moment, and what is that one person going to care about? This isn't rocket science. We're all humans. You know what triggers people. You can find that common ground of what they care about, and that's what you pitch to. That's the skill you develop here to know your audience and figure out what it is for that person, because it'll be different for those different audiences. Um, it's not any different whether you're arguing in front of a judge. It's no different if you're in front of a governor or a mayor. It's, or your, your mom or your dad or your kid. Whoever it is you're trying to get to change what they're doing is putting yourself in that spot. You not only will figure out what, what you need to say and do, but there's a chance you'll find some common ground. And if that's the case, you're, you're really lucky because then you get them to move forward with you. But even if you don't, you know what to, to do and say to get them to act differently. It always works. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, more than mission and more than uh, convincing people, I was curious uh, if you could give us a little more direction with who are the touchstones, who are the centers of gravity in these movements because we all can't get you know, Naomi Klein on the phone or Bill McKibben on email. Where are we? 
bringing that energy toward. I think I understand your question, but if I don't, please hit me with it, okay? Um, I, I would say find, find the cause that most compels you to get up in the morning, besides having to pay the rent and go to work and that sort of thing. You know, What's the cause that drives your spirit for what you want to say at the end of your life you've done to make a difference? Whatever that is, you, you will then find those leaders and you will you be one of those leaders um, and start working at it locally. And you, you will find doors open then for taking that leadership. The Reverend Lenwood that I, that I referred to, you know, he started in his hometown in New Orleans. He's now a national hero, but he didn't start there. Um, does that make sense? Hello. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, the former Michigan AG, Frank Kelly, strongly criticized the decision to charge the officials in the Flint case. Uh, my question is, um, how much, um, how viable are those charges? And if they are viable, what impact is that going to have on the future of the water regulatory system? Well, two questions, and one I can't answer, and wouldn't if, even if I had an opinion because my opinion isn't worth much on it. Those who have made the charges or criminal indictments know facts uh, and the law. I don't know the facts. All we know is what we read in the newspaper, right? So we elect people and they hire people to make those thoughtful decisions the best they can and they are accountable to a broader public. Um, so we will see over time uh, whether those indictments that have been filed and those charges have been filed, what, what those outcomes are, and maybe there will be more of those. So, uh, you know, we are, are we lucky to be in a country where we have those different checks and balances for as imperfect as any of us are as humans in carrying them out? From a big, big picture, how grateful and lucky we are. On your second question, which was, Oh, will it produce change in the laws? Is that a fair statement? Um, we're, we're already seeing it. Uh, you know, again, you, it just you try to. I try to every once in a while to have some perspective. Uh, it's hard some days, right? But if you look at what's happening as a result of Flint um, to the lead and copper rule nationwide, a rule that hadn't been revisited in what 25 years, right? It's being revisited because clearly it is showing it wasn't adequate to protect public health. We have learned more. Was there a decision made 25 years ago to, you know, th that was not appropriate? No, we know more now too. Just think how much more we know about lead. So out of, out of that tragedy comes improvements in our legal system. Unfortunately, we have to learn them the hard way, but that's sometimes how we learn them. And so I think that, you know, whether it's the work on environmental justice, um, that is, we are called to action to do, um, that is also a very powerful result out of the Flint water crisis. You know, I could go on and on about a few of the positive things. I just don't want it to appear, because it shouldn't, about how, um, we take opportunity out of crisis, because if you're a Flint resident who can't drink their water, you're not, you're not so happy about that. It's, it's like the people suffering from the flooding in southern parts of the state now, where somebody gets on to the media and says, you know, out of, it's a good thing out of this tragedy we're learning, and if you are one of those sufferings, that's not a good thing for you to hear. You wanted us to have learned the lesson before that so they're not hurt. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. My question is more broadly about environmental justice, more so about the Executive Order 12898 involving the EJ 2020 Action Plan. Um, I am doing a note on prisoners and how they're impacted by 
environmental justice issues. And one thing that I noticed while reading um, the executive order, that the definition of people who are protected or who should be protected underneath that, um, that executive order. Do you foresee um, the EPA or someone uh, in DC adding prisoners at, to that definition of protective individuals underneath that plan? That is very cool what you are working on. So it sounds really important and it will be well read. So a very important, very important job you are doing. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, the, the hard questions I give to my students, what can I say? Um, and we have one here. So Sher Sherry White is the woman I was referring to before who worked in the environmental justice program at EPA, right? So I would, would like to connect you to her because she may have some very wise counsel for you. Um, but we, we, we won't know the answer to your question. There is, elections matter, elections have consequences, and so a new president uh, gets to decide what he thinks about the environmental justice executive order of the previous presidents. Um, that is his prerogative. So we will see what the direction is of the environmental justice programs in the future of the federal government. We, I don't think we know yet. Sherry, is that a fair statement? I'm going to ask a question. So one of the, you know, as a longtime public official, one of the, uh, when I look at the, the Flint crisis, I often find myself as a former state official myself looking at it through the lens of those environmental regulators, the folks that were accused of, in the report, of, of environmental racism, and thinking, Th those folks didn't go to work. They didn't take those jobs. They didn't go to work. They didn't wake up in the morning thinking, I'm going to make people sick. Just to the contrary, they saw themselves as implementing a set of laws and, and programs, albeit imperfect, that they thought were going to make people's lives better. And I wonder, and I would appreciate your comment as someone who's run for office and also as a public official, is, is it possible for us to break out of what feels to me like a, a period of time in which across the ideological spectrum, there seems to be such a deep mistrust of government and an unwillingness to invest in government and public officials, that we keep, uh, whatever solutions we come up with, we keep ignoring the need to invest in those programs and those regulatory agencies and to lift those people up and to empower them to, to really do their jobs. I, that's my sense, but I wonder if you, you know, your perspective on that. Well, you have a right to have that sense because you were one of those regulators. You've, you've had all those different hats. Um, and so in my response, having all those hats, is that um, when people trust who they have put in positions of power, they are, they are willing to give you a whole lot of discretion about how you solve the problem. When I, when I ran for office and said, I'm going to stop urban sprawl, well, I didn't say I was going to, I said, I'm going to work on stopping urban sprawl. People go, mm-hmm. Not one person asked me how you're going to do it. When I said, I'm gonna to work to move moms and dads out of poverty so kids have a better life, nobody asked me, how are you gonna do it? They look at your resume and where you've walked to demonstrate to them that you actually mean what you said, see that was credible what you said was your reasons for wanting the job, and B, did you have the skills then to actually work on it? Did anybody expect me to stop urban sprawl completely? No, they wanted somebody to work on it. So when you, when you talk about bureaucrats, and I say that respectfully, not uh, as an insult, going to work every single day, the public wants to see them trying, right? And so when the, the misinformation or the uh, communication problems and language and, and words get in the way and, and d destroys the trust that people have in those that are working for them, it takes a long, long time to rebuild that. But he didn't set me up for this. But I get to take this opening to say that no matter which of these spots you're in, whether you were a regulator or whether you were um, a public official uh, elected, um, no matter what the head is, you know, you can choose to do those different things at different times. And one of the things the Vermont Law School has asked me to do this fall was to put together a workshop on how to run for public office. Because we are seeing, right, nationwide, 
this enthusiasm to run for public office because people are figuring out if I don't like some, I should do something about it. And one way is to run for office. And so you can step up and be that person to take a swing at the bat at this moment in time and give it your best shot. It's November 11th, right here in this building, 9.30 to 3. All right, so oh, here we go. Please, Professor Latham. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so my, my question is, we have this massive government infrastructure, local government, state government, and the federal government. And yet somehow this system completely failed the residents of Flint. And so I, I wonder, as part of a lesson here, that government, the reliance on government to address these major environmental issues that we face, whether it can do that, and, and whether our reliance on government is misplaced based on what happened in Flint. Like, what were the people on, at 77 West Jackson in Chicago, that is where Region 5 is headquartered at, what the hell were they doing? How did this happen? Well, I'm gonna answer that question by posing another question, and your point is so, so well taken, especially given the role of media, which only shows things that go wrong, right? But I would also ask the same question you are, Professor, in other areas. For every child, young person, or adult sitting in a jail or prison right now, what did every level of government fail to do? For every kid that doesn't graduate from high school, what? So I would ask that not just about the environment, but across the board. But then I would not stop there because we are the government. It's not just somebody else's job. And if we don't step up, whether it's to do that hour a week, then who do you have to complain to? So, you know, government can't solve and every problem. It wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to create a structure for all of us to get up every morning and say, what can I do to move the pieces to produce a better result? That's your job. Democracy is a blood sport. So do you wanna go home and watch TV? Or do you wanna be on the field? My son, who's the light of my life, I am so proud of, you know, is so sick of me hearing him say, do not complain, do something about it. When I first ran for office, he was 15 years old and he said, mom, you've done a lot of dumb things in your life. <laughs> but this is the dumbest. <laughs> Thank you for that unconditional support. <laughs> and I said, well, kid, this is my decision, not yours. But more importantly, if normal people don't get up and take a swing at the bat, then we get what we get. He's now the press secretary for Mayor de Blasio. He gets it. He's taken the swings at the bat. And I absolutely agree with your answer. It, it's up to us. Yes. It's up to us. It's not up to yes. Washington or Montpelier. It's up to us. So, yes. so thank you very much. No, thank you for making the point. All right, we've got a couple more minutes. And I'm just betting that there's some, oh, did you want to, perfect. I was going to get ready to take the microphone and find people, but here. He's one of my best friends. We're the ones here on Sundays going to the cafe to get food, aren't we? Oh, we were doing that together. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I just want all my teachers to know I study, so. Um, he is. He's right up in that corner studying. I see him. Um, so I'm ignorant of this situation. And the way I figured I would learn about it was I actually went to Flint and I walked through it and I talked to people. But what I've been reading lately is that it's not just Flint. It's my city of Chicago. It's Los Angeles, San Diego, Cleveland, uh, New York. It's cities where there are heavy populations of black and brown people. And my question is, uh, and I say this respectfully, is this something that is 
ethnic cleansing or is this something that is deliberately being done? Is it something that is happening uh, because it, it's scary, and I think about it like, you know, how, how, does it, how does it affect kids when they drink this water psychologically? Um, are they able to have a relationship with, you know, whoever they see? Or does this, like, hurt them when they drink this water? Well, sir, you, you just nailed your, our last question comment, right? And it couldn't be more appropriate because that is the moral challenge to us despite what may not be purposeful racial discrimination, after a period of time and pattern, when the racism hasn't ended, that is our call to action, right? Yes. And that's what we have, what you have described. So when, when, when do we all get up and say, I'm gonna spend my hour of the week whether it's in Chicago, working on take your issue, whatever one is most important to you. And if we all collectively do that, that's how we can move that dial. Thank you. Call, call it when we see it. Inspire others by doing stepping up like you are here. That inspires action and other people to have the courage to take action. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Falk. That was incredible and moving. And thank you all for being here tonight. And don't drink the water.